Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the opportunity to sit down and chat to amazing humans about their journeys through life. For these episodes, we're talking about neurodiversity. I'm so happy to introduce Michael to the conversation. Welcome, Michael. Hello. Hello. Lovely to have you. So I'm going to let you do a proper introduction to yourself in a second, Michael, but it's an absolute pleasure to have you joining me for this conversation. So tell people a little bit about yourself and, uh, and what's been happening. Okay, cool. So I'm Michael. I'm the director of questions at Make Your Habits, and I'm a raving dyslexic. And I think I'm going to claim that as my uh, superpower. So, okay. yeah, I, my dyslexia has formed me who I am today. And I think that's why I'm here today to talk to you. Amazing. Uh, I love that. And I, I, I've not heard the terminology used like that, a raving dyslexic. So we're going to get into that. So let's talk about the journey. So the story that you, you want to tell us. Tell us a story. OK, uh, well, it probably starts, jumped a bit forward. So when I was 18, mm. I was diagnosed with dyslexia. So I got to uni, you got to university and they were like, oh, does anyone really struggle writing? And I was just like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I right. I managed to navigate my way through the school system because I was a child of the 80s as well. Yep. Which meant you pretty much got on with everything and mm. you just, you're, you're in class and people made you do things. <laughs> so right. I managed to navigate the education system as a small human being and got through it pretty okay. So I got through my GCSEs fine because it was quite simple writing. So it was quite short sentences. And then I got to sec- the, the second form. Second form, what we called it? I can't remember. Sixth, sixth form. form. Sixth form, yeah. Sixth form, yeah. And then where complex thinking needed to be written down is where I fell over. Okay. Because I, because one of my, I can write simple sentences, but when it gets complicated, my head sort of melts a bit because it takes me quite a lot of effort to write. Yep. So, and I think I was saved by the, the introduction of words because that was just when you started to type assignments and things like that. So it was just on the cusp of that bit of technology. And I managed to cheat, not cheat my way through the system, but I made the most of spell checking and thesauruses and things like that whenever I was using documents. So I managed to scrape through sixth form by the skin of my teeth. And then I got into a university doing a sport and recreation degree at H&D level, which was basically the minimum amount of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the minimum amount of writing. I think we wrote about 4,000 words a year in our mm. H&D. Wow. And it was a six-month H&D with six-month summer placements. So, and I had, when I got to uni, when they did the assessment, that's when my world sort of changed mm. because I got the support I needed and the recognition. And okay. university was actually really good for me because it helped me build the strategies that I still use today. Wow. Well, that's, um, yeah, fascinating that you, so 18... What, yeah. what was going through your head before 18 though I know obviously there wasn't that complexity in the GCSE side as you mentioned but 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 what was the struggles you were experiencing it was just really hard to write it was yeah it was everything I used to remember sitting in class looking around at people and going oh my god this is like the hardest thing in the world mm. and I, I was thinking about this the other day I was thinking <laughs> the children of today won't recognize this but when you used to have to send a postcard in to enter a competition right it used to take me an hour to write three lines of an address. I'd sit there in front of the TV and my dyslexia was, can be so powerful that I can read something and forget it by the time I've looked at a page. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's quick. Yeah. And it's, it's that really, the more I think, the more I have to think about the context of what I'm writing, mm. the more my writing goes to pop. So it's that, that link. So it's, yeah. And now I can actually navigate the world and I'm still alive. <laughs> so yeah. I, I've obviously worked out strategies and I do yeah. what I do now. And it's just understanding how to just let it flow, be in it, and then tidy it up afterwards. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And so so when you got that diagnosis at 18 then, so you said about adjustments and things that were going on for you. What what sort of things were in place then? Because I I don't know when you're a child of the eighties, so I'm you know guessing it was the early two thousands, maybe when you were yeah, 18, was dead it? on two thousand and one. Right. So um, what I got that was quite, oh, brilliant. I got uh, got to uni and they gave me a whole PC, gave me a spell check, gave me a laptop. Oh, wow! I had someone to read over all my assignments. Wow! It, I was, For adjustments, yeah, really yeah. lucky. Yeah, yeah, really, really good adjustments. And I think it's, it's quite interesting because I was in Wales, in mm-hmm. Swansea, and they actually had quite a lot of provision there for students. And I can't tell you about any other universities. But sure, there was genuinely a big student union and supporting networks supporting lots of students in that space and because it was a sports course lots of similar people to myself quite 
physically able, yeah. but the mental aptitude may not have been there. Yeah. And the HMDs, there was lots of people very similar to me as well, so it was quite a nice space to be in. Okay, so you knew other people that were going through very similar experiences, did you, and then? Uh, yeah, the house I ended up in three other dyslexics. Oh, wow. <laughs> so between us, okay. we had laptops, computers. Right. Got a, di- got a dictaphone, all sorts yep. of everything you now have in your phone. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I had a device for, sponsored by, and yeah, it, and I'm a, I am a dysphonetic dyslexic. It's okay. my... And that, that was quite fun, actually, the test for that. Can you, can you, can you describe that? Because a lot of people wouldn't know that, what that meant. Um, yeah, dysphonetic okay. dyslexic means I remember what words look like, but I can't spell them. So okay. It, so your T-shirt at the moment has got 24-hour humans on it. It does. I know that human has a, a, like a bulge at the front and then probably an S at the end. Things like It's things like that my head remembers. But I can't spell it, which is amazing because my son's now learning phonetics, which, which makes yeah. me te- me me reading with him quite interesting because yeah, I'm remembering course. it, not phonetically spelling. So I'm having mm. to recall every word that I know in a phonetic spelling. <laughs> it's a uh, it's exciting, and it's because yeah. ju- I say things and he looks and goes, "No, it's not that." I'm like, oh, "Okay, <laughs> well done." Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Well done. Yeah, but like the tests yeah. were really interesting as well when they did the dyslexia tests. Right. Some of them I smashed. Although there was one we did, but it was say as many S words as you can in a minute to try and see if if you can if you have if you're mentally capable of like thinking of writing rather than yeah. writing it down. So it was I got like 58 S words in a minute. Okay. <laughs> the woman gave me a funny look, and she was, I was just like, oh, so have I, have, I, have I not done very well? She goes, you've doubled the highest point on the scale. I was going to say that seems so, a lot. Yeah. So my head mentally is like permanently solving things, yes, bringing answers. But it's that as soon as I slow down to write, it all stops and the thinking stops. And it was that thing when I got to sick form and university where it all started to crumble. And it was mm. the where do I go from here? So it was it was a, a, a good moment. It was actually quite nice to see that I could achieve yeah. in the academic space where you have to write things down. Cause for when I was 18, 19, I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm going to have to just, I was told the school people were like, oh, you're going to put, you would be a fence erector. That's what I got on my, what what job should you get? Because mm-hmm. I didn't like writing and I like doing physical stuff. So, like, oh, you're going to be a fence erector or builder. And that's the, the limit of not knowing you're a dyslexic, where yeah. you, what, what box you get put into. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Just, yeah, on what you can do versus what you can't do, right? So Yeah. And actually that university showed me that I can be in that the written space and mm. annotating things like that. So taking that forward then, so obviously going through university, um, you finished university? Yeah. 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 So, and topped up to a degree as well. So the, last year, the H&D, I wrote 4,000 words. Yeah. The degree, I ended up writing 40,000 words plus transcribing another 40 for my wow. dissertation. <laughs> so incredible. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's so incredible. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. And that was just about putting, I had to put more structure in and actually yeah. roll back the social life. But I, I used to be exciting. That's a shame, be, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Used to be a rugby playing, heavily drinking prop, with shaven right. head and things like that. I really. Different now. But <laughs> actually to achieve that academic achievement, I had to change who I was okay. in order to conform and yeah. just study and yeah sit and re- revise for eight hours a day which was really hard and things like that but i forced mm. myself to do it yeah well done well you, you, you're obviously putting a lot of effort a lot of work to do that many words and mm. uh, to finish that dissertation so uh, brilliant stuff and then you left obviously university yeah what happened next so talk about sort of going into work i guess was next right yeah so work i thought the other six months of the uni was summer placements okay because so, yep. it was sport and recreation management degree and it ran alongside yep. a leisure and travel degree as well so I ended up working for a company called PGL, which was uh, school okay. tours. Yes. I know. And I, yeah, so I started in the kitchen with them. So the, the season, the year, the summer before I went to uni, after finishing my GMVQ, 24 hours later, I was on a bus to go work in the south of France for two months. So mm-hmm. I went, did that for two months. And it was 90 young British based people in a beach club in France where school kids came out to. It was amazing. Yeah, it was just people having a good time in the sun, having a drink, and just being 
20, 19, 20 year olds. It was really nice. Yeah. But that stayed afterwards. So I was then working my way up through, I ended up doing the guest care side of it. So looking after groups, mm -hmm. organizing entertainments, things like that. And just getting, getting places working. Cause I see things in a very process way. Okay. So organizing rotors, people, things, and just getting things to work and problem solving. Yep. So running an adventure center, things are always falling over, breaking. You have to go, okay, what are my options? Yep. And back to my 60 S words in a minute, I look at things, I'm like, oh, there's about 10 options here and narrow it down. Where sometimes you get some people in a problem and they'll go, no, I don't know what to do. And you, it's the, I, I don't I don't understand people that look at a problem and can't think yeah. of solutions. Mm. However, I know they exist and I empathize that sometimes people just can't solve problems. So I'm like, yeah, there's always something to do. So I worked my way up to a uh, system manager out in France. And that was over took about six years, about 2006, 2007. Yeah. And then a bit too much partying. <laughs> so I started to burn out towards the end of that. Yeah. I decided to come back into the, or come and start in the UK job market. And I got a job as the entertainment manager at Soft Play Centre. Okay. Yeah. Because I used to, <laughs> used to train holiday reps. So I can, not it's a hard dance. I could train you to do the cha-cha-cha and all the, all, all, all those dances, the time warp, face pain, right. blue modeling. So I was just enjoying life, <laughs> just doing all the fun jobs. Yeah. But ended up in the UK, at a soft play center in central London as the yeah. entertainment manager. So, and that take a running that still relied on my practical ability to organize things, not requiring me to write too much. Mm -hmm. So, still in a very practical organizing space, but yeah. working with people and trying my hardest not to commit anything to paper or digital format just because that is the place of failure and pain so okay. yeah so that that was my entry into the uk job market in about okay. 2007 yeah and and sort of fast forward or fast track to where we are now then michael i'm intrigued to know sort of more about what you're doing cool so yeah i'm <laughs> a bit of a funny one a bit of a segue so i need to okay. go back about five or six years so from the soft play center i made the logical jump to being a customer service manager for a social landlord oh, okay <laughs> you do yeah it sounds like um, a normal transition normal transition soft play to social housing yeah um but i accidentally found this company called rhp so richmond housing partnership and their aim was to be the best customer service provider in the uk full stop okay and a brilliant employer and they saw the customer care side of me yeah. Like, okay. Well, he can do customers and care, looking after people. We can teach him the social housing. So I ended up there, and it ended up being the Google of social housing. And that wasn't them saying that. People like Standard and Poor used to come in and do the financial assessments, and they go, "This place is amazing." So it was really initiative, right? Sort of forward thinking, management thinking. Yeah. And it just wired my brain about making places brilliant, right. and that. Fast forwards to now to my make your habits. So I, based on my getting things done as dyslexic, it's about putting in processes and doing them consistently to get things done. There's no accidentally sitting down and writing a 2000 word something. Yep. It's about creating the right environment. It's about understanding what your procrastinations are, but also what makes you good. Yep. And I now create my business called Make Your Habits, which is about creating leaders that understand their habits and how they can make whoever they are the best person they are. So it's not about me going, here's my 10 point plan to make you an amazing leader. Yep. It's using coaching to go, right, who are you? Where are you? What do you need? And then having good conversations with people and helping them understand who they are mm -hmm. to get the most out of themselves. Right. Okay. And and sort of in terms of sort of clients you're working with at the moment, are you working with big big organizations or do you sort of have a sort of a sweet spot with the type of businesses that you're trying to support at the moment? So at the moment I'm working with leaders that need a bit of habit rehab. So they've okay. habit rehab, got themselves like habit yeah. rehab. So you've got yourself to a certain point in your career. Yeah. But the things you do no longer serve the role you're in. Yep. And quite often it's sort of two people that I've 
sort of work with. So people that have tried to move on but can't. Yeah. And they've recycled stuff that got them to that point. And it, it's just not cutting it at the level above. They're not doing the right level of thinking. They're not mm-hmm. they're taking too much lower stuff down. Or people that are progressing and keeping going and helping them see that they might need to tweak something they do. So, okay. yeah, helping people on those journeys just keep moving and not getting caught in that trap of, I've done this for five years, I've just changed role and it's now long, no longer working and understanding it's not them, mm. it's something they can change in their habits. Okay, that's interesting. And and so sort of taking your thoughts, you know, talking about dyslexia in this conversation, this part. So mm. obviously you've talked a lot about the strengths of, of you know, your, your your sort of superpowers, I guess, within there and sort of the problem solving, uh, the processing ideas quickly, you know, multiple options. You can see different yeah. things from different perspectives, which I think is fantastic. Is there anything that sort of that you struggle with in those conversations with people or is it all sort of, I don't know, anything you struggle with? Um. So it's not what I've struggled with. It's what I'm. What I've created a space for me not to do. Okay, oh, that's, <laughs> so, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. So, way. with me creating my business, there, there's a couple of things you can do. You can create loads of written content, newsletters, spend yeah. hours writing things, or you can become a coach and actually be. <laughs> I like that. And or because coaching's about getting the other person to do the work, and it's about listening and understanding what's going on. Yes. And through all my roles, all I I have been at my best when I've sort of sat back, looked at what's going on. Yep. And then change something or help create something. Yep. Now the change I'm really going through at the moment is moving from me going, Oh, have you thought about doing X to giving someone the question to get themselves there? Mm. Yeah. So I'm not having to write I'm saying I'm not giving you a I'm not written a book that tells you how to do everything i'm about helping you understand what's going on and then doing it and that's through using my sort of analytical processing side of it so yep. the skill i've learned to look at a problem mm-hmm. and slightly with the dyslexia finding the easiest way to solve something that doesn't involve lots of effort it's almost like something in a complex world we need isn't it yeah and it's what, what's the simplest thing what is what is the base question here what is causing your problem mm. what is causing that bit of friction in your life And normally the first thing that people talk about isn't the problem. There's normally something underneath it. Yeah. That's really causing that conflict and that, um, that whatever that break of equilibrium is. Mm. Yeah. I I find it fascinating because I think you're absolutely right. I think you're talking, you know, around the simplifying things, the, you know, there's, we're in such a complex world. I've said this for many, many years, you know, it's so complicated right now. There's all these statistics that are backing up all the problems that are out there because of complexity, I think, and overwhelming our brains with too much information. So it sounds like, you know, your approach is something that's really quite critical for people right now. Yeah, it is. And when people get it and they sort of understand the, and I like to talk about habits because people understand what a habit Mm. is. Yeah, it's it's not an alien concept. It's because some of the coachy worlds a bit out there and a bit conceptual right. and yeah. But if you bring it to it's a habit, and yeah. actually what you need to think about is the first five seconds when something happens, what your response is. Mm. People go, oh, okay, so I have a problem, and then I just need to think about what I do in the first five seconds, and then from there, you'll set the right path. Okay, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, and that seems real to people and tangible. Yeah. And it's not about finding chakras and balancing and all that. That that very valuable part to some people out there. For yeah. me, it's a lot simpler, a lot cleaner, a lot. Yeah, it's a habit, and you can change your habit. Let's have a good conversation. Yeah, I, I you know what, um, Michael, I, I find it really fascinating listening to you talk, sharing your perspective. Um, it's it's yeah, it's actually enlightened me a lot, actually. Well, cool. So, what I'm what sure. what what particularly has got you there? What what, what did you hear? I think I think it was the simplifying piece. You know, I think we we're running too fast all the time. We don't take time, you know, even sitting down to record these things. You know, we we mm. talked about it before we recorded, you know, running from one thing to the next. We're always sort of overlaying things. We don't have time to break. We don't have time to think. And actually just taking a moment to reflect on what you've been saying, actually, yeah, there's some interesting elements in there that I think a lot of people can catch in terms of sort of the habits, uh, thinking about simplifying, I, you know, things that I've always, I've talked about for a long time myself, but I think sometimes it's difficult to put it into practice when everything's just, there's a million bombardments. So maybe, yeah. maybe from your perspective, what you can share and show, which is what you've shared and shown me is, is that ability to sort of 
almost take an alternative approach to things, bring it down. Ooh. I think it's really useful. Yeah. I think it's great. I love it, Michael. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. We are right at the end, nearly. So oh, it's what? bizarre, isn't it? How does this happen? <laughs> I say this on every single episode of every podcast I've ever recorded. We are almost at the end. We've only got a few more minutes. So I won't say we are right at the end, but I will say we're almost. I want to sort of give you final thoughts to share with people, things or observations, things that you might think people would find useful. Um, so I'm going to throw that over to you once you, I can see you're pondering, you're thinking. He's um, <laughs> thinking. Um, so throwing it over to you, Michael. Any final um, thoughts? Yeah, I just want, I think the final thought I need to think about is whenever you have a problem and you're stuck, is try and think down to what your real challenge is. Mm. What, it's never it's never going to be the first thing that's in front of you. What What is the thing that's under it that's actually driving the discomfort? And it, mm. it, it sounds like a funny question, but you have to give yourself that time to have a think. Yeah. And I think that's probably what people don't do anymore. They whip their phone out when they get uncomfortable. So if you do feel that pain and you're like, oh, God, there's 28 things to do and you see all 28, you don't. You need to plan something. <laughs> you yeah. need to put a plan in place. And what is the simplest step that you can do to move yourself forward? Yep. Really useful, really simplifying. Um, one of the things I've been doing in breaks in training that I've been delivering recently is telling people not to take their phones because mm. it's just not giving them the chance to breathe for a moment, you know? So we, we're running a million miles an hour. The first thing we do when we take a break is grab our phones and carry on doing, carry on doing yeah. stuff. So it's really fascinating. I've loved your perspective, Michael. I really have. And, and I wish you all the very best with everything that you're doing and the work that you're doing as well to, to help to simplify a few things. The world needs it right now. Um, it's been great. Thank you so much for recording this with me. I know it's a very short period of you know sitting together for the last 20 odd minutes, but it's been a fascinating 20 minutes. Brilliant. Thank you for inviting me into your space. That's right. You're more than welcome. It's been lovely to chat to you. Look after yourself, huh? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers.